on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program one of my favorite guests uh, and one of my, I guess I feel like I've been talking for almost 10 years now, uh, professor of Middle Eastern uh, Studies at University of Michigan, uh, Professor Juan Cole, who also uh, has a great blog at it, at uh, JuanCole.com, I believe it is. It's informed comment. Uh, Professor, welcome to the program. Thanks so much, Sam. So uh, I, I want to talk about a piece that you actually had in The, um, in the Nation, uh, which arose out of a question that Martin O'Malley answered. I can't remember exactly in what context. Um, he uh, was asked a question about, about uh, ISIS or ISIL, Daesh, um, and the role of climate change uh, in the rise of ISIS. He was widely, um, I guess, ridiculed for this response, but um, I think we've mentioned on this program before, but uh, not necessarily in regards to ISIS. Uh, this is, um, his response was actually quite accurate. Yes, uh, there isn't really very much doubt about it. You know, I, I think it's, it's, it depends on how you say it. Uh, he, he was very careful in how he phrased it. He talked about how uh, a very severe drought, uh, which is exacerbated by, by the higher temperatures of climate change, uh, created the preconditions for uh, the rise of ISIL. Uh, it's, it's, obviously, people can respond to drought in lots of different ways, but in this particular case, uh, you, you had a situation where uh, in just a few years, 70% of the livestock in Raqqa province died. Uh, these, these are farmers and, and you know the livestock is the most valuable thing they have. And they weren't getting enough water for their crops. So uh, O'Malley put it quite right, is, is that when that happens to farmers, you know, their farms fail basically, they can't make a living out there, they go to the cities. And they look for, you know, day work as a construction laborer or something, uh, which in Syria, you know, might be a forlorn uh, quest. And um, and then in 2011, when uh, the uh, Syrian revolution began, it was mainly initially a youth revolution and a, 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 a protest against joblessness. If you looked at where uh, a lot of the initial uh, protests were, in places like Homs and Hama, these uh, Sunni cities of the center of the country, they were in those shanty towns around the, the cities that were filled with recent uh, uh, rural labor migrants who were kicked off their farms uh, by, by the drought. And while Syria has had you know, cyclical droughts as part of a big arid zone in the Middle East uh, all through modern history, uh, we know that the earth is about a degree warmer now than it was uh, in 1850. Uh, and uh, a degree warmer means that the drought's worse. That's just the way it works. And, and, and um, I mean, I think we have talked about, uh, or certainly um, uh, people have talked about the the um, the Syrian civil war being in some way predicated on, on this. And, and you talk in the piece um, about sort of the the broader implications. I mean, this is coming uh, earlier, I think it was, I guess it was last week now, um, uh, James Hansen, uh, the, uh, the, the former NASA scientist, um, one of the former top climate experts in the, in the country, um, was part of a team of, I believe, 16 other scientists who, who uh, predicted that the levels of sea rise um, uh, that have been anticipated are going to be far greater and far faster than have been anticipated or at least reported, I guess, uh, in the past. And you talk about how this is going to have great implications for the Middle East, uh, more broadly speaking. Oh, yeah. Uh, if Hansen is right, and of course, these things are, uh, are projections and uh, he could be wrong. Uh, uh, but in any case, we know uh, that uh, as the Earth warms uh, and, and we've now put so much carbon dioxide and methane up there uh, that it certainly will warm, uh, that the surface ice will melt over time. And it may take a very long time for it to melt. But even in even the old projections before Henson's recent study, we're talking about four or five 
feet of sea level rise in in the next 80 years. Uh, and in a lot of parts of the world, four or five feet is deadly. It's deadly to New Orleans, it's deadly to Miami. And it turns out to be deadly to the Egyptian Delta, where most Egyptians live. Uh, the, the Delta uh, in Egypt uh, of the Nile Valley is very much like the Louisiana Delta. Uh, and um, so, uh, you know, Egypt is a country of nearly 90 million people. If they have to find another place to live, that's going to cause a lot of trouble. And the same thing is true, of course, of Bangladesh. Uh, but the other thing to say is that uh, uh, the sea level rise, you know, the scientists give it as so many inches a year and so forth, but it, it needn't be uniform that way. Uh, if, if a big glacier uh, from uh, Greenland or, or, or the Antarctic uh, falls in, one of one of these glaciers in the Antarctic could could raise the uh, the sea level itself a few feet, and uh, it could happen fairly rapidly. It would be like a tsunami, uh, in a way. Uh, and a, a place like Miami, for instance, is very vulnerable. Uh, so the Middle East is is among those places that are vulnerable. The Persian Gulf, littoral, is is uh, very vulnerable to sea level rise. Uh, and so you know th- we've got a lot of trouble in the Middle East anyway. Uh, but uh, b- both the, uh, the the desertification that comes out of global warming in that area and the sea level rise uh, is is likely to to have a, a, a huge impact uh, to, to make things even more turbulent. And then, of course, with desertification, there's less water. A lot of the Arab-Israeli conflict is over water, uh, and uh, that could be exacerbated. And we should make the point, too, that uh, in terms of what you, you had mentioned in terms of the uh, Egyptian delta, um, as the, the, the levels rise um, in the Nile, it is seawater that's rising, and that it will, um, uh, will, of course, uh, make the—it uh, makes it impossible to grow anything um, in those yeah, areas. Yeah, the, so the, talk- the sea level— if the sea level rises, uh, and the Nile, you know, now it has lost a lot of its force coming out into the Mediterranean because they dammed it at the Aswan Dam. So uh, it's a fairly, fairly placid river, and it's, if, if this Mediterranean rises, the salt water will go up into the, uh, the delta, and uh, this, there would be substantial salinization. So even in those places that don't get submerged, the, the land will become much less suitable for growing crops, and that will be a crisis. I, I, it's, it's, it's slightly tangential, but um, I think it's worth uh, talking about, really, frankly, anytime we get the occasion, because um, I, I suspect that uh, water is, was a, um, is one of those things that people don't understand the role it played, particularly uh, you know, when people refer back to the, um, uh, when uh, the, there was a deal with Sharon uh, and, uh, before the first intifada, uh, and that uh, supposedly uh, Yasser Arafat had been given 98% of what he wanted uh, from uh, Barak uh, and uh, Ehud Barak uh, years ago now. Um, talk about, just briefly, if you could, the role of water in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, well, there's a competition for, for water. Uh, Israel um, does have now some desalinization, but it's water poor, uh, and uh, it's, it has to be very careful how it uses water, and it, and it does need the water of the Jordan. Uh, it uh, needs the water of Lake Tiberias, and that, that's been a long-standing uh, conflict with Syria. And in fact, one of the reasons that uh, Barak uh, initiated some uh, negotiations with Syria wasn't able to make a peace deal with it was outstanding issues over, over water. Uh, the the Israeli um, uh, incursions uh, and, and indeed long-term occupation of South Lebanon, which lasted for 18 years, probably had to do with ambitions for for the waters of the Latani River in South Lebanon. So, uh, and in, in the West Bank, settlers uh, who were illegally squatting on on Palestinian land uh, that was not awarded to Israel by the United Nations often dig a deep uh, tube wells uh, to tap uh, the aquifer, uh, and then that causes the wells in the Palestinian villages to go dry, 
uh, and makes it difficult for them uh, to, to continue to, to live there. So this, this competition for water, and you know, the Palestinians are basically being starved of water uh, in the West Bank, and, and in Gaza, the aquifer is going to go dry in about five years. Uh, th- this is this is a part of the uh, a part of the of the struggle, and it's going to get worse. And as it gets worse, it's going to cause more conflict. Uh, and so, I, in getting back to your to your piece, you you said that um, the that uh, O'Malley's assertion drove uh, the right wing crazy because it challenged two uh, deeply held fantasies. Um, the first you mentioned, uh, you say, is that the, the earth is not rapidly warming as a result of, of human burning coal, gas, and oil. Uh, I think we are well-versed in uh, the, the, the right's climate uh, change denial. You say the second is that Muslims are intrinsically given to, to violent fundamentalism. It's sad that we have to reiterate the, this, but, uh, but please do. And, I mean, because there, there seems to be sort of a, a new, I, I don't know, I want to get your take on this, because, you know, we were talking about this, uh, this per- perspective, the American perspective on, uh, on Muslims and Muslim countries literally 10 years ago, uh, more, maybe more, we, you and I were talking about this, I'm sure. There seems to have been sort of a resurgence, and I don't know if that's a function of uh, having a president who's a secret Muslim uh, or... <laughs> Uh, or, or what? But there seems to be a resurgence, uh, partly in the guise of this new atheism, partly amongst other things. But uh, just give me your take on this, and, and if you could, about this idea that there's something intrinsic to Muslims in Muslim countries that is violent. Yes, uh, or, or indeed Muslims in, even in the United States. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's a... Um, it, it's, uh, uh, a kind of libel that we've seen before with ethnic groups. And, you know, I don't need to go into the history of the blood libel with regard to Jews. There's a kind of libel that the, uh, the that Muslims are, you know, by, by virtue of being Muslims given to um, killing people. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's the worst kind of uh, racism and, and, and demagoguery. Um, you know, I point out to people that between 1870 and 1945, uh, the people of Europe probably polished off on the order of 100 million people. Uh, This is not because they were particularly evil. There was a lot of upheaval in Europe and it was an age of colonialism. Uh, But it was because they were the first generation to to industrialize warfare and uh, it, it took people a while to, to pull back and realize how uh, massively, uh, genocidally destructive industrialized warfare is. Uh, but, um, you know, in that period, the, the Muslims killed uh, a fraction of that. Uh, uh, there was, of course, the Armenian genocide. But uh, it, it, there's nothing, you know, intrinsic about Europeans that drives them to kill 100 million people in, in, in 75 years. Uh, it, it was it was the social uh, and political uh, and economic conditions of Europe that that drove these conflicts, and the same thing is true for the Muslim world today. Uh, there had been you know countries where there was a long long periods of relative uh, uh, stability in Muslim countries. They were all still Muslim then, uh, so you know uh, uh, Tunisia is an example. I don't think it's been in a war. Uh, since uh, 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 since the end of World War uh, Two, and it has had relatively little social violence until very recently. Some some of it is a spillover from from Libya. They're Sunni Muslims. Uh, they're Muslims like anybody else. So you know, just if you do this the thought experiment, if it's Islam that's driving this, it doesn't make any sense that it's variable over time because they're not, you know, they're they're not going in and out of Islam. Uh, so it, it's just a it's a crazy idea. And it's it's driven by propaganda. I think the long years of the Iraq War, the Afghanistan Wars, where the, you know there was inevitably some faction of Muslims that was the enemy, uh, has has harmed their image. Uh, but we see in the opinion polls uh, a real spike in, uh, in 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 hatred of Muslims in the United States. Uh, and uh, and then there are silly things said 
Uh, particularly, and I have to say this, by evangelicals who you know have a kind of propaganda machine against Muslims, uh, with whom they're competing for you know converting people in Africa and so forth. But uh, they'll they'll say things like you know the Quran commands Muslims to kill infidels, which is not true, uh, or that mosques are a place where you you plot out terrorist act- actions, and therefore mosques shouldn't be allowed. So the whole the whole thing is is very smelly. Uh, and, well, and what dangerous. do you think is is I mean, have you been able to sort of isolate what has um, led to this bump? I mean, is it is it because we don't? I mean, I, because I'm trying to figure out. It seems to me like there's this new sort of wave of anti-Muslim um, uh, sentiment that um, hopefully is crested, but, 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 but it's a, it's, the wave has increased, and I can't help but think uh, that it is, in some respects, a function of having an African-American president who is suspected to be a Muslim, who can't get out there, and, you know, when George Bush said we're not at war with Muslims, I mean, sometimes he said, you know, he said uh, stupid things like, eh, it's a crusade, uh, but but he, you could at least cite this guy who was uh, more or less an evangelical and say, we're not at war with Muslims. Well, now, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, President Obama would say that because in the minds of uh, a, a, a not insignificantly large portion of the, uh, of the United States electorate, he is a secret one. I mean, so, I mean, is that it? Is it there hasn't been mitigating forces? I mean, what's, what's going on? Oh, I, I think it is a very perceptive uh, set of comments, uh, Sam. I, I do agree. I think uh, that um, uh, that Obama is president, and that there's this uh, hysteria on the uh, on the right, and not the far right. You know, this is this this belief that uh, that Obama was a secret uh, Muslim uh, was held by, uh, or is held by a, a very significant proportion of, of people who vote uh, Republican. Uh, that, that it made it difficult for his administration to get out in front of these issues. Uh, I think uh, I can remember in the 2008 campaign, uh, there were a couple of women here in Detroit uh, at, a, at a rally who were wearing uh, Muslim headscarves. And uh, uh, some of the more zealous Obama uh, campaign staff sort of asked them to move out of the picture right. uh, because they just didn't want a, Obama to be tagged in that way visually. Uh, and I think he he apologized for that. But yeah, there is that dynamic that you're pointing to that I think this administration, uh, A, doesn't feel that it can come out in front uh, without weakening its own position on uh, the issue of Islamophobia, but also then it is not taken as seriously as you, uh, as Bush was. And, and by the way, George W. Bush was actually quite good on, on this particular issue. Well, I mean, and certainly, uh, too, as uh, you know, prior to 2001, uh, the Republican Party was making some serious inroads, if I'm not mistaken, with the Muslim American community in terms of like fundraising and uh, uh, voting. I mean, I, 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 I'm not sure of this, but I, uh, I think that it, if Bush didn't get more uh, Muslim votes than Gore in 2000, uh, then it was pretty close. But um, oh yeah, no, the the, the Muslim Americans uh, were disproportionately Republicans. Uh, it would have been a sixty forty split, I think, uh, in in that era of the nineties. And uh, you know, it was partly that the Republicans had come up with this strategy of of, of cultural politics. So they they started. They're they're really about you know protecting billionaires from taxes, but there are so few billionaires that you need somebody else in your coalition. So they right. decided to, to, uh, to adopt, uh, you know, anti-abortion stands and sort of appeal to the religious right. Well, uh, you know, a lot of American Muslims had similar values to those of, of, of conservative Christians. And so it was natural for them to gravitate uh, towards the Republican Party, not to mention that uh, a lot of Muslim Americans uh, are entrepreneurs and, uh, and appreciated the uh, uh, the message about uh, the value of entrepreneurship and and uh, and the evilness of taxes. Uh, so um, yeah, but after uh, the Bush started the uh, Iraq War in particular, I think he drove the Muslim Americans into the arms of the Democratic Party, uh, and and now the, the the Republican Party, you know, has become so anti-immigrant, and that's another issue that affects Muslim Americans. 
and it's not just uh, Mexicans that are in the uh, or, or Guatemalans that are in the sites, and, and you can see that in the discourse of someone like uh, Donald Trump, uh, that um, uh, they're being grouped in with with other immigrants, they're being tagged as violent in the same way that uh, that Trump is trying to tag uh, Me- Mexican Americans as you know rapists and and, and so forth. So the uh, uh, yeah, I think there's been a really big shift, and it's consequential because there are uh, a few states, uh, Michigan, Ohio, New Jersey, uh, Florida, uh, where, uh, you know, the electorate is fairly evenly divided, uh, and where there are very substantial numbers of Muslim Americans and Arab Americans. So in a place like Ohio, they're, they're, in, they're big enough that they actually could swing the uh, the state. Fascinating. Um, so I, I want to move on to um, to your perspective on uh, ISIL because um, it. I mean, it's a little bit early to tell, but I I suspect if I had to bet, I would say that this Iran agreement is going to go forward. There may be a vote by Republicans in the Senate to uh, attempt to get rid of the president's statutory authority to execute the agreement, but I think that'll be vetoed, um, and we will have a deal which will hold off to the extent that Iran actually has any nuclear weapon ambitions. It will hold off, um, you know, for uh, 15 years um, any any moves they could make to execute that. So, I mean, I'm imagining a world where on Sunday mornings, John McCain doesn't have anything to talk about uh, when <laughs> Iran is, uh, is uh, not the ostensible uh, nuclear threat and ISIS or ISIL um, may be just sort of a, a, a blip. Tell us why you think uh, ISIL is doomed or, or, or why I should say you see six top signs, what the top six signs are that they are doomed. Yeah. Well, uh, ISIL, in my view, I've always looked at it as a flash in the pan uh, because it's grown up in places where the state collapsed. Uh, and uh, it's played on, on ethnic uh, divisions between Sunnis and Shiites. So I, I never thought that it, it had staying power. And uh, I'm convinced that, uh, you know, five years from now, we won't be talking about it. it Maybe something else, but we won't be talking about this particular organization. Uh, and um, so what's, what's been going on, and I don't think this gets covered because our press, you know, does this pie- piecemeal kind of uh, approach to, to news, but... Uh, what's going on is gradually uh, ISIL's territory, uh, which is landlocked, remember, uh, is being cut off from resupply. There's a logistical war going on uh, that's being orchestrated by the United States. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, they say in the Army that uh, everybody wants to do uh, strategy, but real men do logistics. Uh, uh, and uh, the um, logistics is getting men and materiel around. Uh, so uh, one thing that's happened is that the, uh, the, the, the Kurds in Syria, uh, they're about uh, 10% of the population and they predominate in the Northeast, have been encouraged with U.S. Uh, close air support uh, to close off uh, the, uh, the border between Syria and Turkey uh, to, to ISIL. And so ISIL is based in Raqqa, uh, the city in, 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 out in the eastern desert. Uh, and if you go due north, you get to, to Tel Abiyad, which is a, a, a border crossing into Turkey. And they were using that as a conduit uh, through Turkey for arms and ammunition and men. And that's cut off to them now. Uh, uh, the Kurds have cut it off. And then the U.S. has finally gotten Turkey to come on board about closing the rest of the border to ISIL and, and even... Turkey's Air Force now this, this weekend began bombing ISIL positions along the, the, the Syrian and Turkish border. I, so I was going to ask you about that. I mean, are, from Turkey. how much are yeah. the Turks actually fighting? Because I know that there was uh, that ISIL basically um, uh, attacked uh, Turkish forces or in some way I, I, the exact um, sort of incite incitement. I can't recall over the past couple of weeks. But how much is Turkey actually sort of, I guess, uh, closing down the border, fighting ISIS versus using this as an opportunity to also uh, fight the Kurds. Yeah. 
Well, it is using it as an opportunity to fight uh, the the more radical uh, Kurds uh, who are based in in Iraq, and and they've done a lot of bombing uh, this weekend also of those positions. But what what happened was uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago the the uh, um, the uh, ISIL hit uh, a rally at Saruj, which is across the border from the Kurdish enclave in Syria of Kobani. And uh, it was a rally of leftist socialist youth Kurds who were going to go down and, and you know, uh, vol- do volunteer work with the people in Kobani to help them get back on their feet after ISIL was driven away. And uh, uh, they, their rally was, was bombed. Uh, 30-some people were killed. It was horrible. Uh, and this inflamed uh, the the 20% of the Turkish population that's Kurdish because they felt that the that the current government, the AKP government in Turkey, which you know is a center right government, is kind of tinged with Islamic themes, uh, it um, that they accused it of being uh, soft on ISIL, uh, and that's something that Western analysts have also complained about that the Turkey didn't seem to see ISIL as as dire a threat as everybody else in the world does. Uh, And so I think that bombing on Turkish territory of Turkish citizens uh, and and the person who did it had been recruited from the Turkish population uh, finally alarmed the the, the government enough, uh, both because, you know, it it could face very substantial uh, discontent from the 20 percent of Turks that are Kurds, and also because it it, it didn't want to be outflanked on its own on its own right uh, in, in the Muslim community. Uh, so I, I you know it, it appears to be that there's been a sea change just in the past week uh, on Turkish government policy towards ISIL, and it could be extremely consequential because if ISIL is cut off from its Turkish uh, smuggling routes, uh, then it, it's going to be you know left increasingly without resources. And then in Iraq as well, it's it's being surrounded by the uh, uh, Iraqi army and, and, and Shiite militias. There are 20,000 of them sitting outside of Fallujah as we speak. And uh, uh, at some point in the next few months, as, as the weather gets better, there's going to be a, a big campaign. And, and I think they're going to be have, have the province of, of Al-Anbar taken away from them. You know, there are only 25,000 fighters, so if the Iraqis want to get rid of them, they can. And uh, you mentioned that um, uh, ISIL has lost their sort of access to a lot of gasoline and kerosene, right, from, uh, uh, I guess, refineries uh, north of Tikrit. Uh, And over time, that's going to wear on them as well, because this was... This was their 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 money source. Are they getting money at all from any of the Gulf states? I mean, initially, it seems that there was uh, some of that uh, sort of Saudi money and um, and other Gulf states were were pouring money into the uh, Iran of the uh, excuse me the Syrian uh, civil war, and a lot of it ended up in in ISIL coffers. Has that been shut down? And I mean, do we have a sense of where they're getting their money from now? Uh, I, I think the analysts generally feel that uh, the Gulf contributions have been dwarfed by the money that ISIL has been making from uh, from smuggling out uh, gasoline and kerosene. Uh, so it's control, and, and you know, raw raw crude is not is not valuable. It's only once it's been refined that right. you can sell it for anything. So they have a few refineries, uh, small refineries in Syria. Uh, uh, around Raqqa, and they have uh, they had uh, access to uh, some uh, petroleum at the, at the Beji refinery in Iraq, but they've been kicked out of Beji now. And uh, uh, I think over time, uh, uh, this uh, and then if, if the border with Turkey is closed, by the way, it's harder for them to make money by the, by by smuggling. They they put this stuff in canisters and put it on little trucks and take it across the border and sell it. Uh, and uh, so, I, I, you know, the, the logistical side of it, of closing off their access to Turkey, is going to hurt them. Uh, they are losing uh, access to, to refineries uh, as, as the war against them uh, is not going well in places like Nineveh province in, in, uh, in, in Iraq. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that the money that's coming in from the Gulf uh, can, can sustain them. Uh, and, and the U.S. has, you know, 
worked against uh, these contributions. So three Kuwaiti businessmen who are what are called Salafis or hardline Sunnis uh, have been uh, put on a treasury watch list for having sent money. Uh, and I think I think those sources of revenue are going to be closed off to ISIL over over the uh, over time. I mean, it seems to me that um, a, a good sort of bellwether of just how seriously the United States is taking the threat is a reluctance to bomb the refineries, right? Because that is, you don't want to bomb the refineries because refineries are expensive to build. And, you know, that's an infrastructure you want to exist uh, after ISIL is gone, uh, particularly if you're the U.S. or any, uh, you know, any interest, I guess, in that region. But if you really want to stop them from making money, you just bomb the refinery, right? Well, you could you could do that, uh, as you say. It, it has long-term consequences for the economy. You want the people in that area uh, to have uh, some money after ISIL is defeated, uh, or else there's danger of further radicalization. But as I said, the other thing you could do is just close off the smuggling routes uh, and make it difficult for them to, to make their money with the uh, with the gasoline. How are they getting the uh, the raw product? Oh, uh, it, it, they have uh, some of it is being pumped in their regions, just within the region. So they own the the, yeah. the fields yeah, as they, well. They, they they actually have fields. Okay, that was one of the reasons they took Palmyra is they got gas fields. Okay, all right. So and, and so lastly, let's talk about that other part of uh, of John McCain's career, uh, and that being um, Iran. Give me a sense. I mean, we hear obviously in this country. Um, uh, I think we have a, a a fairly good sense of where people stand on this deal uh, from the Republican perspective. This is uh, nothing short of treason uh, because I- Iran is is Stalin and uh, Hitler combined with also mystical powers of of being able to hide things. And so they have some magical. And Skeletor, I guess, also. Um, and I think the Democrats, it seems to me, are going to come around, but they need to sort of uh, uh, maintain some type of skepticism to make this a, 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 a turning point that is, is driven by the facts of the document. Um, but around the world, I mean, give us a sense of, of some of the key players, like the the uh, w- where are the Saudis on this? Like Where are the Pakistanis on this? I'm curious as to different... Um, um, I don't know if I would call them stakeholders, but but different key players around the world. What is their perspective on this? Well, they're they're split. Uh, Pakistan, of course, is a nuclear state and never signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and never was inspected, uh, and so they don't have very much of a leg to stand on here. But to tell you the truth, the evidence seems to be that Pakistan is excited uh, that uh, the sanctions are likely to be taken off of uh, Iran. Um, Pakistan feels that it can play a role in mediating between Iran and the West. Uh, And then uh, it has its eye on on oil and gas imports uh, and and pipelines from Iran, uh, which have been impeded because they can't can't raise the the loans from the uh, Asian Development Bank and so forth to make the pipelines. So, uh, so I would say, on the whole, uh, the Pakistani government uh, response to these developments of diplomacy with Iran uh, has been very warm and positive. Uh, and um, uh, you know, the, the situation in the, in the um, Persian Gulf is different. Uh, Saudi Arabia uh, seems to be seething about it all. Uh, they would just as soon Iran be kept under sanctions and be kept weak. Uh, they are afraid that Iran has uh, some kind of uh, secret aspirations for a nuclear weapon. Uh, and uh, however, the Saudis are only one of the states, uh, the oil monarchies uh, on the Gulf. Uh, Oman uh, actually played a role, a very central role in getting these negotiations going. Some of the first meetings were in Muscat uh, between Mr. Kerry and Mr. Zarif. Uh, and, and Oman has been very enthusiastic about uh, this. Uh, uh, process and um, I think Qatar also uh, is uh, kind of more more neutral towards it or, or even favorable uh, than Saudi Arabia is. So uh, and and then Dubai is jumping up and down for joy because uh, Dubai is a major conduit for Iranian uh, uh, finance to the outside world, 
And so the bankers in Dubai are, are, are looking forward to, to uh, uh, good times. So, you know, when, when people say you know, the, the, the Arabs are against it, uh, it, it, it it's, you have to go country by country. There are the, the, the Iraqis and the Syrians are Arabs, and they're all for it. Uh, and then even in the, among the Gulf oil monarchies who have a lot of influence because of their vast wealth, uh, they, they seem to be evenly split. Uh, so it's it's not the case that it's uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know an Arab ethnic uh, position. And then give us a sense of 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 where I mean you know the the, the politics of Israel are such that uh, it seems to me that the the vast the the, the entire spectrum of the Isra- Israeli political body seems to be uh, objecting. Although you're starting to see uh, some dissent coming from. Uh, the national security apparatus, because they are actually like uh, not as I guess politically uh, exposed, and uh, you know can express their opinion about the 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 value of this deal. But in terms of like long term, I mean, does this end up uh, helping Israel um, in, in some fashion? Because suddenly, I mean, it seems to me that. Whether imagined or real, this uh, desire for Iranian nuclear weapon, that idea became a leverage point for the Iranians in some way. Like you can't deal with the other issues, uh, the other regional issues, because there was this sort of specter hanging over the the. Uh, any of those talks or machinations, and that's going to be sidelined now, theoretically. Um, give me your sense of of who else uh, gets value out of uh, this deal. Well, I, I, my own view is that uh, the the danger of Iran to to Israel was always hyped. I mean, Iran does say horrible things about Israel, and uh, one of the uh, one of the outcomes of this diplomacy uh, in in the medium term may be that that Iran is more tied with the rest of the world, and already Germany is putting substantial pressure on Iran uh, that if it wants all this trade these trade deals and so forth, they're going to have to moderate their position on, on on Israel. But you know, it's 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 mostly been talk. I mean, Iran has supplied Hezbollah with 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 uh, with rockets. Uh, and possibly Hamas, but in Hezbollah's case, uh, uh, those are, are, you know, it's impossible for, for Hezbollah to use them uh, to launch an offensive war. They're, they're mainly uh, defensive. Uh, and uh, so the, you know, active uh, military threat to, to Israel from Iran uh, has all along been a little far-fetched. Iran is a long way from, from Israel. There's lots of countries in between. Uh, Iran has a very small and, and underfunded uh, military, doesn't have an air force to speak of. So, it, 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 you know, it's kind of a little bit crazy to be talking about Iran as a threat to Israel. You might as well, you know, talk about some Southeast Asian country as, as a threat. Uh, and uh, so I think that the Israeli right has, has hyped, you know, Iranophobia as uh, a, a way of taking the spotlight off the ongoing uh, a settlement uh, program that they have in Palestinian territory in the West Bank. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that they're squawking so much on, on the Israeli right uh, is that they're about to lose that issue, and, and uh, nobody's going to pay any attention to them when they bring it up. And therefore, uh, it's going to be harder for them to evade uh, the real issue, which is that they're refusing to make peace with the Palestinians. Uh, and uh, the Palestinians can be made peace with, uh, contrary to what they keep asserting. And it can only happen if they uh, stop stealing Palestinian territory and resources and, uh, um, and indeed pull the settlers out or make some kind of territorial arrangement uh, uh, with, the, with the Palestinians. So my own guess is that as, as the, the Iran issue subsides, and I think you're right that it will, uh, and and as ISIL is, uh, I'm saying will be defeated, uh, that uh, that spotlight might come on the, on Gaza and the West Bank in a really big way. And I think uh, Mr. Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of Israel, is really uh, afraid of that happening. 
Yes, uh, I can imagine. Uh, Professor Juan Cole, University of Michigan, we will link uh, to your site, Informed Comment, at uh, juancole.com, uh, uh, at our blog at majority.fm. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Likewise, Sam. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>